It's This Week in Creationism, episode number 19. I'm your host, Joel Duff, and we look at the headlines in the world of creationism from the past week. This week we have Ken Ham Sue's Feds, ICR logo miscue, species definitions, and a little bit about Crater Lake. That and more coming up. Well, let's start with Answers in Genesis, and I'm going to, I I felt compelled to say something about an article um, that covers a topic that I usually don't refer to on This Week in Creationism. I I usually set aside the the sort of uh, social, political, um, um, theological articles that uh, appear on Answers in Genesis and other creation ministries, and I'm more focused on the relationship of science and faith and looking at how Uh, science is integrated into or scientific questions are understood within the young earth perspective and that's the that's usually what we're covering Um, but Ken Ham wrote an article that um, I I think deserved at least a mention and I I'm I'm going to use this article to uh, sort of highlight some of the differences in approaches from one young earth ministry to another in terms of how they interact with their own audience uh, and the issues that they find important Uh, So let's get right to it. There's this article on the front cover, Christian Liberty, We're Still Fighting, and it has to do with Ken Ham's um, revelation that he and his organization, Answers in Genesis, have um, um, gotten together with uh, other organizations to sue the federal government about the uh, vaccine mandates. And uh, I don't want to go down the whole trail of the vaccines and and talk about that. I'm going to uh, stick to one small portion of this particular paper. But here's it is. Essential ministry, Christian liberty, and suing Caesar. It's essentially his defense for why um, Answers in Genesis should be involved in suing the federal government. Um, And it's also his explanation about why he doesn't think his employees should have to get vaccinated. And embedded within that article, now, I, I, there, there are portions of, of what he writes that I don't disagree with about um, the necessity of, of church and um, freedoms and so forth. All right. I mean, he is defending something. But one thing that rubbed me the wrong way that I, that I have to point out, and I'm going to use this again to, defend, to talk about um, answers in Genesis compared to some of the other ministries, is this particular line here. Certainly, people died from the virus. Although I think we're all confused about what the actual statistics are. People die every day from all sorts of diseases. And then, of course, his main point, which he bolds here, is, but once a person dies, God's word tells us that they'll spend eternity in heaven or hell. All right. And so that, you know, so yes, people can only die once. And once they're dead, they're going to spend eternity in heaven or hell. And so the most important thing for our ministry and others and churches is that we Uh, deal with people's souls and to take away our opportunity to do that is a life and death thing okay now i I get that point um but it comes on the backs of on the back of this phrase that comes before it certainly people died from the virus although i think we're all confused as to what the actual statistic are statistics are he's using the wording of those who doubt that 850,000 Americans have died, that they um, that they talk about and reduce the severity of this uh, of this whole pandemic. And they suggest that maybe, you know, doctors are lying or that they're calling people who died uh, of something else. They're saying they really died of of covid. And so they're um, and and, you know, I, you probably hear it all the time. If you look at any discussion board, on Twitter, Facebook, whatever, People suggesting that many, many fewer people have died um, of coronavirus. And what he's doing here is, I don't know what he really believes about coronavirus, but what I do think he, he does is he picks up on what his own audience believes, right? What his primary audience is, the people who are listening to him uh, and following answers in Genesis. He understands what they believe. And he is, he's, this, this line here is saying, yeah, okay, we get you. Right. We understand, you know, that um, you're you doubt the severity of this pandemic. Um, And so we're fighting for you. This is a semi subliminal message to his followers that, yeah, we're doubters, too. Or at least we understand your doubt and we're not going to do anything to dispel it. That's what I have trouble with with this particular uh, article. That's where um, 
I, I guess I get a little bit upset. Ken Ham is very well known and respected within certain groups, right? Within certain audiences. So he has the opportunity as a leader to speak truth, right? And by speak truth, I mean to doing the research. He has an organization that presumably has PhD scientists in it who could research these questions and not have to be confused as to what the actual statistics are, right? Yeah, sure, the general public is confused because they hear different messages. More people than have died, there's an excess of deaths. Oh, many fewer people have died than we, than we thought. And it leads to this, I can just believe whatever I want. I don't, you know, truth is hard to find. It's not actually that hard to find if you're willing to actually dig through the numbers and try to understand um, the issue. And so what he's doing is he's, he is shirking his responsibilities as somebody who has influence over a large community, which often falls prey to misinformation. And rather than fix misinformation, he simply uses their lack of information to, um, to make them feel good about their own beliefs. And What's interesting about this is, and, and again, like I said, uh, maybe really frustrating for me and, and kind of makes me angry that um, leaders, I understand individuals who are confused about things about the pandemic. It's, it's a complex beast, this whole pandemic. Uh, but those who are in positions of authority need to speak more clearly and boldly and what does Ken Ham like to say that he does? You know, that he's speaking the bold truth, right? But time and time again, what he's really doing is he's reflecting his audience's beliefs. He's taking on their beliefs. He's taking on their apprehensions rather than saying, I have a chance to teach you. You respect me. Listen to me. Even if you don't agree with what I say, I, there's a chance I can. Uh, he has a responsibility for um, and he's one that can reach this audience like others can't. Now, let me contrast that with um, Creation Ministries International, their approach. I've been watching Creation Ministries International and, and actually Institutes for Creation Research uh, for about anything that they say about the pandemic and COVID. And when I've uh, compared them, it, it comes down to ICR kind of just ignores the whole thing <laughs> as much as possible maybe writes an article on the origin of viruses or something that maybe mentions COVID. Um, Creation Ministries International is the exact opposite of Answers in Genesis. They have written multiple articles about the pandemic. Um, here's a, a really excellent, very long, thorough article on uh, their position on vaccines, vaccination, and also discussing you know, uh, all the different treatments, uh, ivermectin, hydro hydroxychloroquine, uh, all those different controversies. And I'm going to say, I, I think they do an absolutely wonderful job. Uh, John Safardi here has been very clear on this issue. They have taken it upon themselves, both he and Robert Carter, um, uh, have, uh, uh, and there's, and there's one other, I'm sorry, I've forgotten who that was. Um, the, the Three of three of their primary um, PhD scientists at Creation Ministries International have done videos. They've written articles. They have had response times in which they've discussed things with their audience, um, and they have come very strongly down on the side of vaccines and the necessity of vaccines and how they are God's gift to us. And not only just encouraging people to get vaccines, but saying it's something that we need to do and should do. And they are requiring their, um, their employees to get the vaccine as opposed to Ken Ham, which doesn't require it, uh, doesn't talk about it. Their ministry doesn't really mention any of these things. Uh, they barely talked about masks or, or anything like that, right? It's, it's all been, this is what this is what our audience wants. We're going to appease them, which is kind of the, it's kind of ironic because because Ken Ham is always talking about how the secular world just tries to appease. You know, everyone just wants to do what they want to do uh, rather than making difficult decisions and following Christ. Right. And, and taking the hard path. But when it comes to issues like this, all of a sudden it's, hey, whatever you want to do. Right. Um, we're not going to stand in your way. You know, this is all about, uh, you know, personal freedoms and, and so forth. 
Um, Creation Ministries International is very much, this is the Christian's duty to protect those who are vulnerable, um, to be vaccinated yourself, to do what you can to reduce the effects of the um, pandemic. I highly encourage looking at Creation Ministries International's material. Um, they go, they take the position, and they and they say this. You know, we're put in this position of authority over many people who respect us, look at us, and read our other materials. Right? We're scientists. We have um, a more of an ability to assess the data than the average person does, and so it would be irresponsible of us not to dig in, assess that that information about vaccines, vaccine safety, uh, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, all these different topics. It would be irresponsible for us not to look at the literature, come to some conclusions, and, and actually bring those conclusions to our audience and make them more, <sighs> inform them, right? Get them better informed on these issues. And they have taken some serious heat for this. As you might imagine, their audience is very similar to Answers in Genesis' audience. And when you tell them that hydroxychloroquine doesn't really, there's no evidence to back up what people are saying, um, boy, they get some heated responses. Yeah, the, the discussion sections on their, um, their YouTube channel are, are just like they can't believe that they're doing this and they're very upset. And this is highly risky for Creation Ministries International, which depends on uh, donations from those same people. But I, I only give them uh, amazing props. They have, um, they have, as scientists, looked at the data and come to the best conclusions that they can come to. And they've said, we need to tell our audience this, whether they like it or not. Um, this is the polar opposite response of Answers in Genesis, which again, I, I'm gonna reiterate, in a way, they reflect society, their society, right? They reflect their audience back to them rather than Creation Ministries International, which is saying, we have been put in this position and we are going to be teachers who are going to elevate our audience's understanding and bring them to a better understanding of how to understand science and faith. Um, and so I have so much more respect for Creation Ministries International. I say, well, you have respect for it because you probably agree with their uh, particular stance. And I, yeah, it's true. I do agree with much of what they say. Uh, I don't want to keep going on that or I'll get, uh, I'll get a little bit too uh, fired up. <laughs> uh, Institute for Creation Research. So I, I don't know if I should be embarrassed about this or not. Um, yeah, I, I think ICR should be a, a little bit embarrassed, um, but it's been noted by, and this isn't going to be new revelation, uh, it's already been, it's out there all over the place that ICR made a, a little bit of a boo-boo when they made their new logo. And so I talked about their new logo in my, this year in creationism review, and I made a big deal about how they're changing some of their, um, they're, they're changing the direction of their research, their focus. It's more biology focused rather than physical science uh, uh, focused. And, and in, in, cha in, in, in changing their focus, they decided they needed to change their logo. And they changed their logo to have this DNA molecule. And it just completely escaped my notice. I admit it, that uh, their DNA logo is left-handed. So it's, it's rotating left-handed. But, but DNA molecules, actually, it should have been rotated uh, right-handed because that's the way all DNA, or standard DNA is. There is something called ZDNA, which is backwards uh, rotated uh, DNA. I'm not particularly upset um, that they don't include a major and minor groove in their particular molecule. I mean, this is just an artistic rendition, and it just gives you the, the idea of molecular biology in their, in their logo. And a lot of people are making a big deal about, like, look, hey, they're, they're a, they, they call themselves a research institute, right? They're an institute for research on creation. And they're focused on DNA as a molecule, DNA as a source of information for understanding um, uh, the origins of, of organisms. And you would think that if their focus is on DNA, they would at least know what a DNA molecule looks like. I'm going to give them a pass on this. Maybe I'm doing that because yeah, I didn't notice either. Um, but there actually, there's a, there is a, uh, there's a website uh, called, you know, that's the uh, left-handed DNA 
uh, Hall of Shame or something like that. It's 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 it it demonstrates that hundreds of times by many people, including textbooks and other places where um, you know the artwork shows the DNA in the wrong configuration. I do entire lectures on the structure of DNA for my uh, um, genomics and my uh, gen genetics class. And so, of course, I talk about all the different parts of the DNA molecule and uh, make a big deal about the direction of, that it spirals. And yet, I looked at this logo and it never even occurred to me to think about the direction that the, the molecule is going. So I'm not that upset. I think it's a fairly innocent mistake. I think that, you know, hey, they sent it over to, they only have a couple people there that actually work on DNA at all. Um, and I suspect this was just like, hey, we, we want a DNA molecule. And they told somebody who's an, a, a graphic artist who doesn't know anything about DNA. <laughs> I mean, and who knows, maybe they copied, they started out with something on the internet that was already wrong, copied it, you know, and they ran with it. And then, you know, the, you know, the president, uh, Randy Guliuza, um, just looked at it and was like, oh, that looks nice. And they didn't think any more about it than, than I did. Um, so I'm not going to beat them up for this. I, I will be interested. I'm following to see like if they will change their logo. I mean, it's all over the place. I mean, changing a logo isn't a trivial process, right? Because it's part of so many different things. Um, and so it's, it's already worked into their newsletter and, uh, you know, might be, on, or might already be printed on letterhead and, you know, so it's, it's not, a, it's possibly not even a cheap thing to do, um, to change it. So maybe they just stick with it and it just, you know, I, I don't know if they'll ever acknowledge it. Uh, maybe one day it'll just show up being different. Um, we'll see. All right, not a big deal. I think it's just more of a of a fun uh, news item. Now, uh, more seriously, I've uh, in my last this week in creationism, we mentioned that Ken Ham was pretty upset about Fox News, um, FoxNews uh, dot com, um, or yeah, FoxNews dot com, and and. He, he was pretty upset about them running uh, a high-profile um, uh, article uh, by help. I mean, front-page news type stuff, right, about Adam and Eve and how Christians are grappling uh, with the histor historicity of Adam and Eve. And uh, in that article, it places a, it gives a lot of words, right, to Josh Swamidas and, and uh, Craig's latest book. And only way down at the very end does it mention Nathaniel Jensen, who gets like a line saying like, you know, you know, Christians really should be, you know, these these are aberrant views. And we need to come back to the the uh, the biblical view, the true view of, of Adam and Eve, which we have been uh, supporting. But clearly the the author of this Fox News article is is stressing, you know, the diversity of views among Christians and how many of those other views have gained uh, traction over over the years, and just the very the the very fact that Fox News is carrying this article, um, I think, you know, upset Ken Ham um, that uh, showing how how far these views have gained traction that they would enter into even new sites like Fox News, and sure enough, here's Institutes for Creation Research, um, Jake Hubert, who writes an article about this, you know, noting too, wow, Fox News ran this article. Uh, highlights Josh Swamidas, and then mentions at the end that, you know, biblical creationists barely get a mention, right, in this particular article. Um, so I, I think that gives you something of a, of a lay of the land and how, how worried I think uh, young earth creationists are that they're kind of losing grip. Um, they've had sort of the main message going to... Um, it, I'll even say the broader Christian community, but that broader Christian community for them has become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and it is becoming somewhat, you know, in line with uh, the smaller and smaller uh, community that are Christians that are of a particular flavor and particular, um, uh, I'll say, political bent. Uh, and so their, their views are becoming more tightly associated with other things that go far beyond creation science, uh, that also, but that, you know, that might give them strength in those those particular individuals, but it reduces their overall strength on uh, affecting uh, the the society as whole. And I think that that's what is so 
upsetting about these particular articles is it really kind of in it's kind of in their face that they've lost a lot of their uh, influence on um, a lot of the the press that has generally been favorable toward them. Um, Institute for Creation Research also uh, getting back to just a, some kind of semblance of a science story. Uh, Crater Lake National Park up in Oregon. Serene beauty after volcanic history. And um, it, the, the basic story here is that these uh, Timothy Clare and James Johnson get together and they talk about how Crater Lake is a fantastic example of, of, a, of a massive volcanic explosion that must have happened near the end of the flood. Um, and all I want to say about this is that uh, this is so typical of, of articles here. They don't actually present uh, any physical, much physical evidence of like, where is the ash layer from this? I mean, this is a massive explosion, absolutely huge, one of the largest uh, in recent times. And they don't, they don't, um, they don't explore like here's physical evidence that is evidence of this happening at the end of the flood. They simply say that's what what it is, you know, and and how marvelous it is that we we have this beautiful site even though it's part of a large explosion. I, it doesn't take a whole lot of work to go in and find out. Um, from those who actually have studied this site, and I wonder whether they've read any of these papers, that um, in the walls of this crater itself, right, there are multiple layers of volcanic ash from prior explosions in this particular area of the same mountain, because there used to be a mountain here. That mountain then had undergone many, 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 many different volcanic uh, eruptions, laying down many, many different layers of ash and uh, uh, pyrocaustic flows. And all of that would have had to have been after the flood. Well, all of that had to develop. The entire mountain had to have developed um, after the flood because all this material is laid down in non-aqueous uh, environment, and that could be easily determined by looking at the, the the nature of the volcanic material all right the magma and how it uh, solidifies uh, under the air or underwater and so an entire mountain huge mountain had to form after the flood before the mountain blew its top and then even after that there have been volcanic explosions uh, from this particular crater that have laid down more ash in this area and when you go out and you go out in the surrounding area and look at uh, the ash layers found in other lakes, um, there is, yes, this massive explosion happened in the fairly recent past. It's considered to be only like seven to 10,000 years old. It's, that's actually extremely young compared to most geological formations uh, that we talk about from conventional dating uh, perspective. And however, those same lakes have multiple different layers of ash separated by layers of non-ash, in other words, years of sedimentation. And, uh, and, and then you have to go all the way down to the bottom of those lakes to find some kind of basement rock that then you would say is from the flood uh, because those lakes would have formed after the flood. And then all, those, all that deposition had to occur before this particular volcanic explosion happened. You know, how do they fit all that in? They just act as if, oh, you know, how can we explain this particular uh, crater? Oh, well, it happened right at the end of the flood, you know, because they have to acknowledge there aren't flood deposits inside the crater. So it had to be a post-flood thing. But as I'm, as I'm pointing out, there's a complex history here of many, many different events occurring that each had to have been spaced out over different periods of time. Uh, and so if all those things had to happen before this explosion, um, where they put that? Because you only have, you know, 4,300 years ago, maybe you had this site and now you have the beginnings of a volcano. And that volcano has to grow and do all these different things to develop a mountain before you can have this particular explosion. This would have to happen not too far in the distant past, right? Um, and yet you have evidence of Native Americans uh, in this region thousand, well, you know, according to conventional dating, 10,000 years ago. But in for Anches and Genesis, they ran there after Babel, which would only be around 4,000 years ago. 
uh, and they lived in around this particular these types of areas uh, when the crater was already there, right? <laughs> and this place wouldn't even be habitable for probably 50 years at least after this thing blew its top because this entire region would have been absolutely devastated. It would just have been ash and nobody would live there because there's nothing to eat, you know, and subside on. Uh, it just another classic example of a picture and then, oh, how do we explain this site and giving some very vague, um, um, vague story about how it could have occurred. Um, but dig into the details and the story falls apart. A uh, new creation blog sponsored by Is Genesis History has a very short article by Ken Colson. Um, and Ken Colson, uh, this is actually from his uh, blog, Creation Unfolding, uh, republished from there. Secular scientists are not the baddies. <laughs> and and I, I appreciated this, this article because um, he has... And, and this, again, is reflective of many of the what I've what I've called the new creationist or new wave of creationists that that are those that are uh, for all, almost universally working outside of the major young earth creationist apologetics ministries. Um, those who are working outside of that are far more creative and um, um, <laughs> thought provoking, I'll say, and and, and more interested in in exploring topics and understanding science i'll just leave it there let's read this quote though many creationists are very suspicious of secular scientists and tend to think that most are out to wantonly lead people astray well why do most creationists believe that because that's what ken ham and leaders of other creation ministries are constantly telling their audience warning them about how their kids are going to be led astray by by scientists in any secular uh, um, situation, right? Or even in your own church or even in your Christian school, it might be seeping in, right? You know, everybody who doesn't believe in their view of the Bible is actively in their own mind all the time working against God and therefore intentionally trying to um, every their, their every waking moment, you, you you almost start to believe they are intentionally trying to warp the evidence of the world and try to undermine the scriptures. Ken Colson says, though, the truth, however, is that most scientists haven't really thought about the big picture. Right? They're not sitting around thinking about um, the origin of the world and themselves and their place in it and uh, and, and thinking, oh, there's this Judeo-Christian viewpoint of, of redemptive history, and I don't believe that's true, and so uh, I am working to prove God doesn't exist because otherwise I, I, I can't survive. I have, I, have to, I have to somehow dismiss this, 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 uh, this attack or this, uh, this worldview that, uh, that, I, that, I, that doesn't make me feel comfortable. So therefore, I'm going to oppose it with every fiber of my being. Yes, they believe Darwinian evolution, but that doesn't mean they necessarily have an agenda to proselytize the world. Um, I think this is a pretty bold statement to make on a, on a creationist um, uh, website. Uh, this infiltration, now between that, that paragraph and this paragraph, there's a, there's a section on, on Eugenie Scott and Dawkins and others who, you know, of course, that's who Ken Ham talks about all the time, right? He constantly is quoting from from renowned atheists who really clearly are upset about religion and are attacking religion. And it is, a you know, the very deepest fiber of their being, something that makes them and drives them to do what they do. But as Ken Colson says, and I can confirm because I, I live in that world and I talk to people who aren't... Um, Christians, and um, you know, it's not like their every thought is like, how can I defeat, you know, creationists uh, and, and show that they're wrong, right? For the most part, they don't think about them at all. And they're not, they're not, and that's not what drives them. It's not what motivates them. I think misinterpreted by creationists is an assault from the broader scientific community. Is it really the broad scientific community that are all out to get creationists? Yes. Anti-creationist propaganda is rife, sure, um, but that doesn't mean most scientists are out to knowingly deceive people. 
Most, most scientists are just normal people who love science, want to contribute to humanity's love affair with knowledge for the purpose of furthering many aspects of human endeavor. Now, I would say, you know, I would, I would wish that scientists have as their ultimate purpose to glorify God, right, in terms of how they explore and discover uh, God's creation. And so it's true. They aren't doing that with that mindset um, that what I am doing is bringing glory to God because I'm revealing his creation. I'm revealing what he has done. However, um, just because you don't have that mindset doesn't mean my mindset is everything I see, I am going to, I, I am doing for the sole purpose of defeating that other mindset. Um, no, I, my colleagues and my friends and the science giving community I'm part of, they just love exploring, understanding, and finding out new things. For some of them, it really is about bettering human society, like bringing, you know, uh, uh, discovering things that we can use to make our lives better. Um, it's not about undermining religion. That's not their first and foremost purpose. Now, as I said, there are people who will take whatever evidence there is from the world and they'll, they'll turn it toward and against and try to show that this disproves uh, particular religious views. Um, but I don't see that as the, the core effort, um, despite what it may seem sometimes when you read creationist literature. It, it's very much of a, everybody's out to get us. Yeah, no, I'll just, I'll just go on. Let's go on. today. I mentioned this particular journal in um, uh, another talk I just uh, recorded recently. And um, I'm just going to show you that a lot more happens in creationism than most people see if they just look at the main ministries, Creation Ministries International, Institute for Creation Research, and uh, Answers in Genesis. They have uh, their own uh, journals, and they publish articles uh, by, we'll call them creationist academics, who uh, explore topics in creationism. And many of those articles are probably read very, very, uh, not read very much uh, by the general creationist public. Uh, and it, But there are other journals out there that I think take an even deeper dive uh, at times into topics and are probably even less read, but they're read by other creationist academics who then eventually sort of absorb those ideas. And then those ideas eventually become, you know, embedded into or influence uh, other mainstream articles written by creationists. I mean, this isn't that different than other communities uh, of, of scientists, right? It, there's specialist journals that very few people read, but eventually that information percolates out and read by a few people who then take that information and put it into more general articles and eventually makes it to Scientific American or something like that, which is what the public is going to read uh, eventually that's communicating science to the public. So I love to look at these articles because if, if you're going to understand creationism, you really have to get down and see how creationist, um, you know, what their inner thoughts are, and they are exploring uh, very difficult topics in places like the Journal of Creation Theology and Science Series B, colon Life Sciences. Uh, they had an interesting volume uh, uh, from this journal in late 2021, A Creationist Perspective on Species. Presented here a special collection of papers on creationist concepts related to species. Now, it, species concepts are, are an interesting topic, you know, regardless of whether you're interested in creationism or not. Um, defining a species is, is rather difficult. I, I think it's interesting to think about species from a creationist perspective, because remember, creationists um, don't say, young earth creationists today, modern young earth creationists, don't say that species were created by God. Uh, that God in the beginning didn't keep create kinds as species, but he created um, kinds which had the ability to adapt to the world, which included diversifying into a multitude of different things that we call species. And so what are these things that are species? That's a that's an interesting question for creationists. How do we demarcate the differences between species and yet at the same time allow for the fact that those species are have common ancestors that make them part of a larger kind and um, so 
here is a discussion of of species versus kinds, um, although kinds is embedded in these discussions as well. So uh, just to read a couple titles here, Minimal Discontinuity Species Concept, a Practicing Taxonomist Attempt to Understand Species and the Creation in the Context of Barominology, which is their word for taxonomy, really. Species as Brushstrokes, the Revelatory Species in Creationism. So Kurt Wise has a different um, uh, guiding principle for understanding how to identify a species or, or understand what a species is within creationism. And many times these concepts are very similar to the types of concepts that are discussed in the secular literature because taxonomists such as myself would say that there's no easy single definition for what makes a species a species. How about genomic equivalence and speciation, proposing a new criteria for barominology? using genetics to identify species. Ontogeny as a diversification analog. Um, these are all, uh, all of these are actually quite fascinating articles, um, especially uh, from somebody who, myself, who knows a lot about the different um, models for understanding speciation. Um, they really are interacting with those models. And one thing I'll say that's good about creationist literature, like this particular literature, not, not, the, not the stuff like Crater Lake stuff, which I don't learn anything from when I read that article. I learn absolutely nothing. You know, all I do is see they don't know what they're talking about. That's all I learn. But when I read these articles, um, I'm challenged to think about, Yes, they are actually thinking through some of these difficult um, questions in how to demarcate and differentiate between species. And by them grappling with it, but from a different perspective about where species come from and how they originate, um, it actually helps me think about um, uh, the topic myself. And so I have to, I have to constantly grapple with, you know, does, does this make sense? Oh, that's actually, that's a really good point. Um, this needs to be addressed uh, in other literature. So I would say I do learn from, from creationist literature very much. I think, I think it, it is a, it's a stimulating uh, exercise. And I have to say that because I do so much research on uh, trying to understand creationist literature, I have learned probably more from scientific literature and advanced my own knowledge in many different areas um, especially since I had to be really broad to discuss all these different topics in creationism beyond my own specialization. I have learned more. I've been forced to learn more from creationism than I would have learned in, in any other context. Um, and uh, so it's made me a much better, well-rounded scientist uh, having, you know, reading these particular articles. So I was, I always recommend to, to people that they should read a, uh, I'll call it a, an academic creationist article once in a while, uh, just because I think it's 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 like reading something out of the box, and it might give you new ways of thinking yourself. Um, yeah, I think you're going to find that they're wrong, and I can always identify areas where I think they're they just they're missing something. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I find them fascinating. I discussed that particular article uh, in depth uh, on a recent uh, YouTube video: "Divine Genetic Guardrails," or are there? divine genetic guardrails that can be identified by creationists that form the boundaries between different kinds. Uh, and ultimately, is there a guardrail that stops variation from continuing to be explored and keeps kinds within some kind of, some kind of, haha, uh, boundary? I, you know, an analogy from a friend uh, once was, um, you know, if, if, if uh, you started with a, a bowling ball and you said that that bowling ball was like the original created kind and then you started it down the alley, right? There's different places that that ball could go, right? It can explore a certain amount of space, right? Before it falls in the gutter, <laughs> you know, and then, and then the gutter just guides it all the way straight down to the end. So, you, you know, if, if you start out as a, a particular kind, you're allowed to explore this amount of space, but you can't jump over into the next lane. Right. And the next lane is a, another kind. And that's what that's what creationists are saying. God created all the different lanes in the bowling alley. Uh, and he began at the at the at the first line. Right. That's where God created those kinds. 
uh, and they created them in a specific spot, you know, and, but they had the room to explore the lane. Now, the, then the question becomes like, but how wide is the lane really? Do some kinds have a super wide lane that they can explore over time? So that, and then where's the, at the end point, how, how wide could that be? And then how would you identify things that were on either side of the lane? Because if the lane gets too wide, it might be difficult for us today to look back and see that they're actually connected because they're so different now. Or maybe some kinds have very narrow lanes. And, uh, and, the, and the question becomes, how do you identify where the gutters are? Like what keeps the organisms from going into the next lane? What keeps an organism from going from one kind and slipping across to be more like another kind or becoming another kind because it enters another lane? Um, all those are interesting things to, to think about, I think. And most of those things I've, I, I think about because creationist literature actually makes me think about those questions. And I think that um, uh, actually creationists need to think more about that, um, those, those guardrails um, and identifying those if they want to be able to say that kinds are, are truly different and separate from each other it should be obvious why they're different from each other, separate from each other. And so far, I think they've really struggled to find those criteria to, to prove that there's an end to the lane, the beginning to the lane, and those lanes can't possibly be connected if you went farther back in time. Um, yeah, let's quit there. Uh, thanks for listening. Again, um, my name's Joel Duff, and you can find my writings on naturalhistorian.com and subscribe to this YouTube channel and find out what happens in This Week in Creationism next week.